Good evening and welcome to the January 11th, 2022 meeting of the uh, school committee for the town of Foxborough. Uh, we'd like to welcome uh, our member, our community members in attendance and also note that we uh, have two committee members that are not available to join us this evening, but we do have a quorum because there are three of the five school committee members in attendance. So. Um, as typical, we will start with open public comment. There is uh, one community member who has signed up to participate. So uh, Brian Watts, if you'd like to come forward to the table um, and please state your name and address. Good evening, uh, Brian Watts to Twilight Drive. Hi, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I am here to um, discuss and express some concern. S sir, would you mind just sitting the microphone? He's kind of acknowledging from the back that we need the microphone in front so everyone can hear the folks watching at home can hear them thanks good evening uh brian watts to twilight drive uh thank you for the committee for having me here uh, i'm here to express my concern uh for the current um high school return to play policy for our student athletes um i represent a group uh that we've discussed and had some communications with the school about this. Um, we don't feel that it's quite right in the policy that they're following now from back in the earlier stages of COVID. Um, we're looking to have it reduced from uh, what they're saying up to 17 days down to five days uh, as what the CDC has recently recommended in late December. Um, all of our student athletes on a specific team, they're vaccinated, asymptomatic. Yes, they get this new variant of COVID here and there. Um, handful of examples, kids are going to see their pediatrician, getting sign off, and then they're still getting the slow cog in the wheel to return to play. Um, so I'd like to voice that. I don't know if you table it, if you'd like to discuss it. So uh, our typical policy is that we hear your comment. We do not typically respond. Okay. Um, so we want to thank you for, for sharing your feedback and your opinion. Um, if there are some components that may, that may be addressed as part of the update tonight, I do not know. Um, but if there is something that, we, that can be followed up on, then somebody here will take the appropriate action. But our normal policy is that we don't respond or engage in any type of dialogue in the open public comment section. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Um, just one last item. I mean, I, like I had mentioned, it's we the school is currently following a kind of an older policy, I would like to call it. Um, one from 2020 that states in some of their forms. Um, uh, British Pediatrics, et cetera. And then the school references the American Pediatrics Association. So I'd like to just try to get on one page, get current to where we are with other schools in the Hawk Mock League, for example, that some of the school department heads have been to those <laughs> athletic director meetings, et cetera. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then next on the agenda is the approval of minutes. So we have the minutes from the uh, December 14th meeting. Were there any changes or um, modifications? Any um, any inaccuracies in this? Any minutes? Brent? No changes. Okay. I did not find any. I'd move to approve the minutes from Thank December you. 14th. Second. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes for December 14th. Thank you. Three zero zero. Okay. So that we're going to now move on. Thank you very much for the uh, next agenda item. Dr. Brodos, I believe you wanted to flip-flop these two did I, or did I misunderstand if, if if that's all right with you okay. if we could flip those that would be great certainly so we are going to uh, flip-flop on the agenda we're going to flip the superintendent's update in front of the teaching and learning highlight for this evening okay Dr. Burgess all right thank you now ask nurse leader Jen Rosenberg to come to the guest table as well she's the first part of this that it would be particularly this time um, of year and everything that we're experiencing it'd be helpful to have her here as part of the update so what i will do is give it a um just kind of a, a summary of where we have been and where we are now we know that the omicron uh, variant is making cases go exceedingly high we see that across the state 
We see that across our own Foxborough community. And currently, right now in Foxborough, the um, positivity rate is 19.52. And that's Jesus. when we think about we're, see, we're used to seeing things in single digits mm -hmm. and a handful. Mm -hmm. And that's not even really including all of those that test at home and it's not reported. That's, that's what is reported. Right. And so we're seeing the increase in our schools with our numbers as well. Currently, um, as of our, we update that on Wednesdays and 128 cases, but I know that we've had more since then and we'll see that reflected in tomorrow's update. I sent out a communication yesterday to give an idea of where, because we do have students that are becoming vaccinated now at the lower levels. Um, received an email today from a parent that um, was thankful for the clinic that we had last night and just talked about kudos to Jen, you know, as far as um, arranging that and how seamless it went. And they were so thankful to be able to get their children there for the booster shots, actually, um, in this particular one. So that clinic went well. Our, I'll just for those that, that are at home or that may not have seen the communication, yeah. the mask mandate was extended till February 28th by the commissioner. It still stands at this point. Districts could put forward a waiver if you reach the 80% threshold. Again, it still comes back to the, the local level and, and our own policy. Our high school rate has not changed. It stayed at 76%. I reported at the last meeting that we had, um, I think it was 18 students, mm -hmm. is that right, that had 19. had their first yeah, dosage. Think, yeah. And if they moved, then that would have moved it to 78%. It hasn't moved. So why they haven't had their second dose, you know, I, I, I don't know, but that's why we haven't seen movement there. But we've seen quite a bit of movement um, with the other schools. So for the Ahern, we're at 62%. Again, that's students and staff combined within the building. At the elementary levels, at Burrow, 41%. Um, keep in mind, you've got preschool at the Burrow. So that's gonna make a difference on your numbers there as well. At the Igo and oh. the Taylor are 52%. <clears throat> Dr. Barrett, just to clar clarify that, uh, the preschool is, does it have to be lumped into the elementary or because it's they're the sub-separate? So it has to be part of the, the same school structure. building and they're not eligible for vaccines. Thank you. Okay. So I that's an important that. notation. Okay. No, that's, that's important. Right. Thank you. Um, I do know of districts that have reached the 80% and have um, applied and been granted that waiver and they've, at this point in time, they've gone back to mask. My, my own, you know, um, mm -hmm. oh children as far as they were at the 80% and they're back in mask because of the high transmissibility of this variant right now. So let me stop there and anything else as far as with the numbers and what's happening in the schools that you'd like to add? So I think an important uh, thing to add, um, I was had my nurses all, um, they, they have been working, I know everyone knows, but I just wanna do a little shout out to how hard they've all been working, weekends, nights, we, um, with these new protocols that they came um, with Desi the day, you know, the, the day before school started, we Zoomed for two hours just to review that. We, so we knew that we were all on the same, um, the same page as far as the changes that they made with the shortened isolation period, the shortened quarantine period, the fact that now we can take at-home tests for certain um, quarantine things. So, you know, all these changes that, you know, were dropped on us right before this opening of the school since vacation. Um, Meeting on Sunday is when you met with the we nurses. We met on Sunday via Zoom. Um, I, we created um, a little kind of quick reference. Um, this is the changes. This is, and, you, know, you know, we're still having conversations. We're still calling each other, like just running, because this is all new to us too. Um, and parents are, are, are confused because these are all new changes. Um, we've posted them on the website, but sometimes parents just like to hear from a nurse, like, what is this, you know, I don't want to send my kid back too early. This is what they're feeling. This is what, is this okay? The parents have been amazing. They've, they've reached out to us they, via email, phone calls. We're all day long. That's what we're doing. Um, but interesting for, as far as cases um, in the district, including st students and staff, we've ha we had 193 over the break. So over that, those 10 day period. And since we've been back, we've had 179 cases. Since in back. Our, since January, uh, January 3rd, the day we've gone back, we've had 179 cases in our district. So over the five schools, but um, the most being at our high school and middle school levels, 58 and 53 respectively. Um, so as you can imagine, that's a lot of contact tracing, um, a lot of phone calls, a lot of emails sent Her? home. So, um, are you still able to, have, have, you, have you and your team been able to keep up with the contact tracing between uh, it, you and administration? It's getting more and more difficult. We're gonna, um, we're focusing on the most important Fine. type of contact. And, and with the yeah. changes, 
in the um, schedule. Like, so now it's only five days of contact tracing. So sometimes we don't hear about a positive case till day three or four. Um, so we're not testing kids for the length of the period that we were when it was a seven day right. requirement. Um, so things are changing, but I, we feel like we're still getting a, a good um, sample of who is exposed. Um, we know that the lunch is probably the most important thing. Uh, masks are down. Um, so, and that's, that's kind of the spread that we've seen if we look back on our data over, over the course of the last year and a half. Lunch. Um, and clearly the preschool is going to be our, our focus too. The kids aren't very good with their masks. So it's, and in special needs classrooms, that will be our focus. But we, I, I think we're doing a really great job. Um, we've been in a um, lot of um, contact with our local Board of Health anytime we have, we have a case that we're just not sure of. Um, and Dr. Bertos had mentioned these cases are the reportable ones. We're seeing a lot of cases that they're at home positive tests. We don't know if they report them to the public health. So Stay the home. numbers in the town could be a little bit skewed too. Uh -huh. Sure. Uh -huh. um, but I think, I think overall we're in a good place. But I do think on the contact tracing, to, I think what you're kind yeah. of getting to there, Brent, is really important in that because of the time period, the feasibility, particularly when you look at the secondary level, it's not feasible in a classroom. So that's why we're asking parents to really be diligent mm -hmm. in monitoring their children and, and, and the students. They're older enough to be able to monitor for symptoms mm -hmm. as well. It, it, that's kind of a different ball game than when we look at the elementary classroom and they're having snack in the classroom. And, you know, anecdotal as it may be, we're <clears throat> seeing a lot of family transmission with, you know, this, this new variant. It's, it's extremely contagious. Um, so with the rules, you know, a, a vaccinated person can attend school. We're still following those protocols. We're just asking parents to be actually a little bit extra cautious. Um, starting, I mean, even a mild symptom like a sore throat, that's what we're kind of seeing. Um, this, this new variant is starting like with a little sore throat. So parents have been great. They'll call us and they say, what do you think? Keep them home. They've been testing if they can find tests. I mean, I know that's, that's a struggle too. Um, but with the new protocols, if they keep them at home for five days, they can return on day six without a test. So we're working with families. We, we understand this is not easy, um, but we want kids in school. So we're, 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 um, we, we've had some really like just honest, transparent conversations with parents, and they've been really great. And when we've been tracking our absences, too, so when we look at our absences from last week, on average across the district, we had 16% of our student body that was absent. But it's trending in the right direction. This week, we've, we're looking at 13%. So we look at students, we look at those absences, we also are, are looking to see um, which ones are, are potentially COVID related or staying home because of, you know, um, just being sick. It's not a perfect science as far as that because so much of it is based on what's reported to us by the parents. So we're trying to look at that, but we're seeing it go in the right direction. Same thing with staff. Um, staffing has been really challenging. Mm -hmm. Last week we had on average 20% um, to 11 percent that range depending on which building and i can tell you that the 20 percent was at the borough preschool was hit really hard sure and we're seeing staff come back but then if you have staff that are out because of their own children that are out so that plays into it but then also those absences are not just covid related you still have other absences whether it's bereavement or some of those other types of things that come with you know it just every day um, in school <clears throat> But looking at those student absences by grade level, the middle school and the high school have been pretty similar as far as their numbers. But again, we're, we're moving in the right direction. So we're really hoping by next week, we'll be having a different conversation even than what we're having this week. Right. And it's important to like note, there are other viruses going around too. Mm -hmm. It's not all. Um, but, but we are noticing that the rapid tests aren't always catching the case on day one or two. Um, and we're, we're having those conversations with parents too. Like, can you keep um, your child home? Maybe an extra day, retest them. Um, and parents are, are they're, they're, being re they're being very reasonable. I mean, this is not easy. It's not perfect. Um, there's, no, there's no black and white. So th we have a lot of gray that we're, we're in, but we're trying to be flexible. Um, and for the most part, I think we've, we've, we've done a really good job. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, First, I want to thank you for your note yesterday afternoon to the community. I was I was actually yes. um, 
I've been thinking yesterday, I'm looking forward to the meeting tonight to get an update. And then a little while later in, in you know, my personal inbox, there was a note that you had sent out to everybody. So thank you for that. I thought the level of detail was terrific and answered all the questions that I had. So thank you. And again, thank you um, for all the work that you and the, and the, and the rest of the, the health staff is doing. It's, I, I can imagine um, the volume um, of calls that you're getting as well as you know, all the other work that you're doing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's greatly appreciated. Um, if you don't, if, if no if people aren't telling you that, like live, hear that at least from me, um, it is greatly appreciated all the work that you're doing. The parents so you. have been great. They they're really appreciative. The, the, the thankful on the phone, um, that makes our jobs a lot easier. Right, so sure. it, appreciate it. And it might be helpful if we touch upon since we did have the public comment on return to play, that piece Please. as well. So as you know, we have a district physician that um, advises us. The nurses meet with Dr. Giuliano. Uh, Monthly. Monthly. And I know you talk to him more than that. So based on the American Academy of Pediatrics, based on our district's physician recommendations, our return protocol is that's what it's based on. Mm -hmm. So after um, a student has tested positive, then they have the 10 days out. It's not the five days. They can come back to school on that sixth day that you were talking about, but it's playing sports. It's not until what day 11 that they can actually start playing and then it's um, five days, six, seven, seven, seven days, days after that for game time. Yes. So that's what the 17 days is referring to. Right. The coming back to school after five, where that's been shortened, the sports piece of it is different, and that's the protocol that has not changed at this point in time. However, I know that you have a meeting again and on Thursday. And we're meeting with him on Thursday, so we'll, we'll readdress it. Um, I just think there's no data out there for them to change a policy that they've, or a recommendation that they have. So um, I know, we'll, I will readdress it with him on Thursday night when we have our meeting. And um, just to, sorry, teacher and me, just to connect the dots further on that, is that just because the fundamental nature of athletic competition is different than say sitting in algebra two? <laughs> Right, right. Okay, I just, just, I just want to be clear that like it's not, it's not apples and apples. Right. And I think a part of the reason is with the history that, um, of the virus and the, um, the myocarditis that was occurring in, in children, yep. I think that that's where the return to play came to be, make sure that these kids were, were ready. More to, conservative on that front. Right. Okay. Um, but with, again, this new variant, there's just not enough data as far as whether or not this is still going to be a worry or is this going to be a, a potential side effect. So. Fine. Um, but and we, we, he's, um, Dr. G has been so supportive of us in our town. Um, so, well, I'll, you know, again, I'll, um, I know it's a big concern. I've had a couple of emails. I know Dr. Bertos has too. So. And just to reiterate what you and Dr. Bertos had said, I just want to conclude it. It's, it's upon recommendations of school and community physicians based upon current data. It's not like we're waiting for a, re uh, <clears throat> a white flag from some agency or something. Right. Thank you. Okay. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. I'm also aware that the uh, the MIA has uh, the Sports Medicine Committee for the MIA just recently, just the just yesterday, okay. uh, voted to recommend to schools the following the Amer American Academy of Pediatrics. So that was the recommendation of the MIA Sports Medicine Committee. But I and I understand there's a lot of complexity to this. But the fact of the matter is a student who's not uh, performing in athletics and is out of school for a period of time should not safely walk onto a court in competition. Um, I'm not even sure it's logical, but we it's can not. still go with data. Mm -hmm. well, that's nice. It's and like as we've learned throughout this last two, almost two years, that we rely on these layers of advice and policy with judgment at every turn to then make the ultimate decision for our community. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate hearing every layer. So thank you. And the health of kids. Absolutely. We can't forget any of this. I know you do this every day, and I know we do this every day, but our decisions is for the health. Right. It's, it, that's, that's the goal, okay, the safety and health of, of, of kids. And so there might be other ulterior reasons, but we're making our decisions for the health of kids on the best data we can on a, on a very challenging topic, mm -hmm. a, a virus that's three times as infectious, and, you know, it just puts us in a spot. Thank you. Thank you. The other parts that I had of my update were more on the two um, principal search mm -hmm. committees. So I didn't know if there was anything else from a health standpoint. Otherwise, um, I, I know you have another 
meeting. So <laughs> more, I guess I just wanted to follow up on the the contact tracing. I was delighted and frankly surprised mm -hmm. to hear that you've all been able to keep up with it because I know of a number of districts in my sphere of life that just basically said, yeah, we can't because it was just it was just eating them up. And so anyway. But, but with that, this week has brought, this week and last layers. week has made it very, very different. I just really want to be Listen, clear about right. that part at, at the secondary level more specifically. Right, definitely. It's just too many, it's, it, yeah, they, they, they move around the building and that's part of right. the curriculum that we've chosen and love. Um, so yeah, no, just keep us updated on that front and I'm mm -hmm. just I'm grateful that you're still keeping up with it because many have simply been unable to. Of, of They've completely abandoned it. Right. Yes, yeah. right. Yeah. And and we have been in talks with our public health because public health is not no longer contact tracing at all in the state. Mm -hmm. They've they've stopped since the middle of December. Um, so Two they they it, given they're in agreement that we, if we couldn't do it, we don't need to do it. But we're doing the best we can do with that. Um, and I think the word feasible is what Desi uses. And um, I think that's I think that's realistic. Okay. Um, we're gonna. We're going to just keep plugging along. <laughs> um, but I mean, at the end of the day, again, health and safety is our priority. So we're going to do what we can do. Okay. And if, if, if a parent ever has a question, we ask them to reach out, you know, email, call one of your nurses. If you if you feel like your child, we're also um, one of the things that we're, we're doing, we're talking with the positive cases and we're actually trying to put a little bit responsibility on that, those positive cases. Reach out to anyone that maybe you were in contact with over the last two days, any friends in school that maybe we would miss because they don't sit at the same lunch table, they don't sit you know, in the same preschool class. So um, we're asking parents to maybe you know, help us out a little bit and, and they've, they've done a really good job. Like the other day we had a lunch table that I didn't, it didn't look like maybe that kid was sitting at that lunch table that day. I, I called the mom. I go, can you ask, you know, who your son was sitting with? She, you know, emailed, emailed me right back with like a list of six names. And I'm like, wow, he has a great memory. Right. So we're do, those things are, you know, happening so that we make sure that we have, you know, the most accurate data. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having Thank me. You Thank you to you and all of our nurses yes. for doing an outstanding Thank job. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. So the other... Uh, part of my update, as you are all aware, uh, Mrs. McCarthy, we'll get to our teaching and learning highlight in a moment, um, has retired. And so we have um, started by getting that process going with the posting and then sending out to parents of the borough school as well as our own borough staff to pull together that um, interview, initial interview team. And then in your packet, you had the whole timeline of what that's going to look like and really backing that from a school committee meeting to where we would be introducing whoever is the selected candidate for the next borough principal, which would be at the March 22nd school committee meeting. That is the goal. Okay. And even this evening, Mrs. Myers Pakla sent out an email communication to all of her families to let them know that she will be retiring at the end of this school year. So both of those two wonderful leaders have had so many years in public education and really have made their mark. So we wish them the best at the same time. It's hard to say happy retirement, but we'll have that search running at the same time. And um, the goal is really on that March 22nd meeting to be able to introduce both of the new principals. So a lot's gonna happen between now and then. Dr. Mello as an <coughs> assistant superintendent runs that initial search. It will be made up of parents um, of students at the high school level, we'll, we'll have a couple of students. Um, we think student voice is really important and at that level, we're able to have them engage um, in that process. And as you all know, we have a very thoughtful and thorough process. So with that said, we've always had school committee representation on those teams. We've had two members um, in the past a lot of times on those committees, but where we have many things going on with negotiations mm -hmm. and those teams as well. I was thinking that even if we could just have one member um, on each of those teams. So that's what I was hoping to be able to um, maybe solidify this evening. But I also know that we have two members that are not able to be with, here with us tonight too. Right. Point uh, of order, Mr. Chair, is that, uh, I, and I'd forgotten, is that um, something we can decide by acclamation or consensus or is it, does it need to be a vote? It, it doesn't need to be a vote, I don't believe. Janet, do you? Do you have to recall? No, I think you can just decide no. by consensus. I don't yeah. think it needs a vote. No. 
fine. Yeah. Um, I'll, I, I'll say that uh, Sarah Ladani in absentia said she'd be pleased to be on either committee. Yeah. Doesn't have to be. Okay. Yeah, Sarah, Sarah had reached out um, when she <clears throat> saw the note um, and had said that she would like to participate and on one of the two committees did not have a preference. Um, and I know that from my previous experience, it was incredibly informative um, yes. just to get to know a little bit about how the different the different cultures in the schools operate and just the overall system. So I think it, it's a great opportunity for Sarah as a newer member of the committee to participate in one. And um, and again, she didn't have a preference. I did I did speak to her and she did not have a Fine. preference. So um, I don't know, it, it, and Michelle did not, I, I, didn't, I didn't inquire with Michelle because she was a last minute um, cancellation this evening, so. You can perhaps reach out to her specifically. Yeah. I'll throw my name in too, I love those things. It, I agree with everything with your experience. You and I were on the same committee and I just, I thought the process that you all have set up and have been uh, implementing for just years at this point is uh, very thoughtful. And uh, if I'm able to participate, I'm happy to do so on either, doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. I, I would, what I would, if, you, if we can do this, again, Michelle was a last minute cancellation because she's not feeling well. That's um, I would love to check with her first Please. because again, she did not have the opportunity uh, in the last round to participate, I don't believe. No. And so if she, if she does want to participate, I would love to give her that opportunity. Um, not that it's mine to give, but at least offer it to her yeah. um, first. And then if that doesn't work, then we can figure out, Richard, are you okay with that plan? I'm fine with that. I, I, I enjoyed doing it the last time, but the time frame as designed would, could be problematic for me personally. Right. Right. So I, I, I would be more of a problem than a help, I think, just right. because of some other commitments. So okay. that's fine. That would work fine if one of the others would yeah. do it. So I'll reach out to Michelle and then we'll confirm. Um, and um, again, Sarah did not have a preference. So once it, Michelle might have a preference. Okay. So if, if that's okay with you guys and doesn't show off your timeline, we'll have an answer. Um, you know, before the end of the week. That works. That sounds great. Thank yes. you. My pleasure. When are you hoping to start up, Dr. Berto's, Dr. Mill? Now the first, well, go ahead, Dr. Berto. I, I, I didn't hear the question, I'm sorry. Sorry, um, what's, the, <laughs> what's the earliest start update that you're uh, aiming at with your February team? February 3rd is for the high school and then for the borough, which is earlier, that one is January 26th. Okay, very good. So each of them will have two um, initial meetings with the, the team, and they're, they're large teams. They can range anywhere from 12 to 14 individuals. They'll meet twice. They will go through all of the, um, the process that we follow. All of the applicants go through a screening process, identify what are the questions that they want to ask. At the same time, Dr. Mello and I will be um, conducting focus groups with school staff because the interview um, team itself is made up of teachers, not all of the staff within the building, and we wanna make sure that we get all voices. Mm -hmm. So we'll have focus groups, and we'll also have focus groups with parents. So when we send that communication out, which has already gone out for Burl, it'll go out tomorrow for the high school, asking if anyone, because we'd like to have two parents on that interview team as well, if they're not able to participate, we surely want to hear their voice. And so it will also have focus groups um, an evening that will go out for both of the schools too to be able to see what they're looking for in their next school leader. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I and think. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mello, in advance because I know <laughs> how time can, or I can imagine how time consuming this whole process is. It is, but it's a great, well, you know, because you did it. It's a wonderful process. It's very energizing. And, um, I, I, I actually enjoy it. It's a lot of nights, but we, we do enjoy it. So mm -hmm. it's yeah. good. Well, that's nice. Thank you. Anything else with the update, Dr. Berto? Okay, then we're gonna stick with you if you'd like to do an introduction for our teaching and learning highlight. Yeah, so it seems like a perfect springboard as we're talking about who is going to be able to steer the ship for us between now and the end of the year at the borough. So Dr. Quigley, if I could invite you up to the guest table. And as he's walking up, Dr. <clears throat> Quigley is, um, no stranger to interim principal positions, although he retired at, from the superintendent position um, a number of years ago in Norwood, actually. He has filled in and helped schools right. out like he's doing for us between now and June. And um, we're really thankful to have his level of expertise there, knowing that he understands what it's like to be an interim and really being able to bring a sense of calm to our families and to our staff and our students at the borough as we go through this process. We didn't feel that this time of year was the best time to be able to go out. 
um, because candidates are not likely going to want to leave their school in the middle of the year. So by having Dr. Quigley with us to steer the ship at the borough for the rest of the year, it'll allow us to go through that thoughtful process. So Dr. Quigley, just if you want to just give a little bit of information about yourself and why you seem to, I mean, you were in Franklin all of last year in an elementary school and yeah. you had a lot going on there. So, <laughs> and you're still coming back. <laughs> Seriously. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Burdos and the committee for the opportunity to kind of introduce myself to the Foxborough community. Uh, this is only my sixth day at the school, but in that time it's become clear to me that the community does have its priorities right. Everyone puts the best interests of the children first. Mm -hmm. Before I tell you a little bit about myself, I want to share a story. Each day I go into the cafeteria to help out, and more importantly, to get to know the children as it's the only place where I can see them without their masks <laughs> and get to know them as people a little bit better. And in the six days I've been doing this, the number one question that all the children ask me is, how old are you? <laughs> 32. And my response is always, I'm old enough. Good answer. It doesn't satisfy them, but it kind of ends the conversation. There you go. So as Dr. Burtis alluded to, by way of introduction, I've worked many years in education, hence being old enough. Um, I've been fortunate to have enjoyed every job that I've had, including my interim positions. But the job I've always enjoyed the most is, was being an elementary principal. The opportunity to work closely with caring, competent, and creative people, supportive families, and of course children, whose energy and excitement and enthusiasm for learning fill me with hope for the future. On a personal level, I'm a husband, a father, and a grandfather, and I'll readily admit that being the grandfather is the best job possible. I have two grandsons. They're in the fourth grade and the sixth grade, and the hopes and dreams I have for them are what I wish for all children. I love reading, music, kayaking, travel, sports, though mostly I just watch, <laughs> and those are just a few of my interests. I look forward to a terrific year working with a very talented staff and caring and committing families at the Borough School. And I believe that working together, we continue to make this a wonderful year and continue the progress that Michelle and the staff have been doing and moving it forward so that when the new person is appointed, we can say to them, here you go, you are very lucky to have inherited a great place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pearson? Uh, nothing, just uh, thanks for being with us. I, I, I saw your resume and where you've been and probably know some of your colleagues for your travels from Norwood through Natick and even in Medfield. I spent many years in Medfield, so I know the schools in Medfield as well. So thanks for being here for us and bringing your experience. And uh, I like what you said too. I, I think one of the greatest values in an interim is to keep the ship steady keep the ship moving forward. And we are very fortunate that the ship was on the right heading uh, at the get-go. So thanks for being part of that and, and keeping it going for us. Thank you. Mr. Reuter? I'll just follow up to say that the other nice thing about <clears throat> a very experienced and competent uh, interim is that you learn a lot in your short time. And I'd only encourage you just to keep passing that information along to Dr. Mello and Dr. Berdos, because I'm, I know they'll be all ears. And uh, so just ev everything that you pick up every day, I think it's all part and parcel to keeping the ship on the right track as we transition to the next generation. So thank you. Yeah, and I, there's not much to add to either one of those, but I do wanna thank you for working with us and joining us. We do feel like we have a really special community um, in mm -hmm. Foxborough as a whole and our school community even more importantly. So really appreciative that you're, that you're working with us through this period and, and excited to see um, what the future of the borough holds. So thank you. Well, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. See you tomorrow. <laughs> I'm coming back. <laughs> hey, good news. That's right. And you can respond, I'm one day older than I was yesterday. <laughs> next time they A little math there. I like it. So.
thank you. So, uh, move. Any other teaching? Uh, part of the teaching and learning highlights, Dr. Berta? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, next is the continued discussion of our fiscal year 23 budget. Mr. Yuknip, Dr. Bertos. So I handed out, uh, or Janet handed out a few items to you. Um, one of them is a one-page kind of synopsis of changes from the original budget you received at the last meeting sure. to the current one. There's no dollar value uh, to the total budget change, but you'll note that there are a few accounts um, that when we went back through and double checked them against our, our personal wage contracts um, needed to be increased slightly to um, equal what the contracts currently call for, although they're all under negotiations. Sure. So um, tuitions, uh, well, there was one that was a salary that just wasn't split properly between a couple schools. So if you look at the high school, the middle school, you'll see a small salary change mm -hmm. uh, in the new budget that you have. Uh, tuition reimbursement for both the educational assistants and the teachers uh, needed to be adjusted to the basis that the contract currently has. And then uh, our extracurricular, which is kind of into three different areas. It's the clubs and, and uh, activities after school for both the Ahern and the high school, as well as the athletic coaches, um, again, all outlined in the uh, contracts needed to be uh, adjusted. The net amount went to what we're currently carrying as our overall COLA uh, adjustment line. So um, that line still obviously is, is dependent upon what happens with uh, contract negotiations. Sure. So the net difference is, is zero, but a few lines have changed within the contract. So I just wanted you to have the most update version of that. Other than that, there are no other changes. Thank you, Mr. Yuka. Thank you. Did you, at the beginning, you, I, I didn't see, you, did you have a question or were No, he actually, uh, I, I, did, I did, and then characteristic to Billy answered it the next sentence, so I'll just put my hand down. Perfect. He's known you for a number of years now. Yeah, he does that. <laughs> so, right? Uh, Mr. Pearson, any questions on the I, budget? I do not have any questions this time. Um, Dr. Burris, any other comments on the budget? No, just I know that we've scheduled our budget subcommittee meeting mm -hmm. because it's not until the next meeting that you'll be voting on the budget. Right. So we'll have that coming up late, so later this week? Thursday. 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 Yep. Oh, it worked? Thursday's on. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for working with me. Yep. Sorry Thanks. to be so difficult, yep. but it's in my nature. And so that, that'll give even more time once you dive even deeper than what you've sure. already mm -hmm. done um, for any other sure. questions. Okay. Thank you very much. And then we will, the, uh, our schedule is that we will vote on this budget at the next meeting. Right. Okay. And obviously in between now and then, even though we'll be meeting with the subcommittee, if any individual members have any questions on any of the lines uh, yes. that go through, as you know, we do keep kind of copious notes on um, pretty much everything from the salary lines, um, staffing versus the expense lines. So, um, happy to be able to basically give that breakdown and explain it to you if there's any issues before we even get to the next meeting, just to help you through the process. Just a reminder, since we're all <clears throat> servants of many masters, uh, when, when's, when's the ADCOM meeting or did it happen already? They actually just published the, uh, the budget today okay. for the entire town. Um, it just That's came out, so I think Marie sent it out this afternoon around three. Okay. Um, so I think the ADCOM actually will be starting its process as typically it does within the next week or so. It's usually mm -hmm. just before the end of January that they start the process. And uh, forgive my lack of recollection, are they supposed to make their recommendation prior to our final school committee vote? No. Or is that, they're, no. They're, they're different lanes. No, you're... <sighs> Thank you. you know, ironically, your budget basically, <clears throat> you know, you have to vote on it by, by your last meeting, which happens to be the January 25th meeting, but the, yes. um, you're only approving it. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't adjust it between now and then if there's, if there's an issue that you find within it. Fine. Uh, but, you know, right now they're dealing with our preliminary budget on the town side because mm -hmm. they know you haven't taken the formal vote yet. Fine. Okay. That's okay. Thank you for the reminder. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anything else on the budget? Nothing for me. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Yukna. Mm -hmm. Continuing on with Mr. Yukna, the, the fiscal year 23 capital improvement plan. So um, 
Another handout Janet gave you was the uh, written kind of description of the CIP budget for FY23. In your package, you had the original five-year plan plus uh, uh, what we actually ended up getting for FY22. Um, our, our normal needs don't change, and, and to be honest with you, um, with all the demands against the, the town's finances, um, it's very hard to even consider you know, adding much in these areas. And that's why we've always been very thoughtful at the end of our school years right. to try to manage any smaller CIP requirements um, out of our operating budget if possible. And as you know, in the last couple of years, we've gone back to the CIP committee uh, when we had some extra money to do some of those things. Um, and we would continue to do that. But these are the standard items that we, we really quite honestly face year in and year out um, as part of our process. <coughs> I will say the one thing that's kind of um, been raising its head, I think for most of us, the police department as an example has its vehicles within their regular general budget because it's, it's, they have to replace them every year. There's no option. It's, right. it's you know. Much where. Um, and we're in the same scenario with the school buses. The difference is, and because it was brought up, so I just want you to be clear on this. The difference is that the police cruisers really are a three-year vehicle. And they're based on their value in the three years. They really don't necessarily meet the, the, the requirement of the CIP. Where ours are 10-year vehicles and are obviously well over the $25,000. So that's what kind of throws us into that direction. It, it is problematic, though, because we don't have an option. Uh, as you know, two years ago, we, because of uh, COVID breaking out and, and really having a, a total um, discomfort with where we might be financially in the town, we didn't buy them. And to be honest with you, we were able to get those back through a combination of last year's CIP plus using part of our operating budget last year. But those vehicles were still waiting on. And it's really started to create a problem for us this far into the process typically we'd have them at the latest you know mid october um so vehicles that we have to count on right now really aren't vehicles that we need to count on uh, or want to count on um this year the the difference is that um and i'm going to be honest with you i don't expect our our cip or any department cip to survive this year because we don't have the revenue in town to do it um, but as always, we put out exactly what we need, um, and then we have to work to manage from there. Right. So our, our computer replacements, which is no longer just computer replacements, it's really an entire system, if you will, between network, operating, wireless, uh, interactive whiteboards. Um, typically, we've asked for 200000 a year, and up until the last year or two, we've, we've been able to get that, and we've been able to maintain our, our uh, equipment. Last year, we got cut to $100,000. Um, it is problematic if you listen to uh, Aaron Heyer, our, our IT director, um, because things that we need to normally do in cycles, um, you know, storage as part of the network, we might do that on an off year when we didn't need as much regular equipment. And we would actually go in and do the network side, the backroom equipment. Um, and without getting that full 200,000, we don't have the capability of doing it all. So we're kind of backing ourselves up there. What's bothering us or scaring us in, in that particular line item is that we know that the, all the laptops that were purchased a year ago are all going to cycle pretty close to that five-year mark. You know, we've already started talking about what options do we have. Obviously, one option we have is that the lower-level elementary units are used less than the middle school and high school, which are taken home. Um, so the reality is, can we maybe survive a little longer on the elementary level, uh, stretch those machines just a little bit further, but still leaves us with nearly 1,600 machines, mm -hmm. um, you know, out just a few years from now that, that will be needing to be replaced. So um, this line is concerning, and, and it's, it, we're going to need a better solution than we have today based on the way that those are going to have to be replaced in the future. Um, the buses, um, these, all bus changes are really uh, in discussions with the DPW's um, uh, mechanical uh, manager, and we have two mini buses which are our top priorities. Um, the one that's the wheelchair one, uh, we really don't have a choice uh, on needing to get that. That's number one. Number two would be the other mini bus. Uh, <coughs> 
and then the final one would be to replace a full size 77 passenger bus um, but again you know knowing that there's going to be some hard decisions made uh, i'm going to tell you right now the wheelchair one is not optional mm -hmm. uh, we need to get that one yeah. <clears throat> copiers are typical um, it's kind of funny even through this whole COVID thing, it, it would seem like, okay, we shouldn't be making as much, but sometimes we made more uh, because the kids were coming and going and we needed them to have materials. As much as we do stuff online, um, we still tend to, to print quite a bit. And it's, uh, so we, we've been in a cycle of replacing those throughout the district. So the four that we would normally replace are still there. And we are asking for the funding for the second year of the music equipment replacement at the high school and middle school Last year, even though it didn't get approved by, it got approved by CIP, but to use our operating budget money that we had left over, not because of the CIP money. Yeah. Um, so we were able to do the first year out of it. Um, I don't believe we did all of the first year, so I'm waiting for Cammie's breakdown of how she's gonna reorganize what would be the priority for the 56,000 mm -hmm. um, as far as equipment. So I don't have that for this meeting, but I will definitely have it for the next meeting. Um, but again, the, the, the point on that one is it was a three year, $175,000 uh, total proposition. Um, and if after this one, we'd be at 50,000 for next year. That, okay, I was gonna say, cause it get, I was wondering if even at this level, we're stretching it out to year four or year five? No, it would be still three years at this point. Okay. If we can get this year's fine. Mm -hmm. Big okay. if, but yeah. So this would round it out from the de very detailed proposal we had two years ago. Thank you. Yep. And then I, I keep putting the Taylor School renovation out there because as we've already talked about, we've actually had this on, on the thing for years. Um, I will be working on the uh, statement of interest. Actually, when we had the MSBA out at the borough, we were talking and they asked the question if that would be one of our next ones. We did say yes. Oh. So um, funding wise, we won't really need funding until we get to a feasibility study mm -hmm. uh, in which we hire an architect to, to basically um, give us you know some cost estimates and what needs to be done type of thing uh, that's probably i would say the best case depending on the msba is probably uh two to three years out okay so it won't be for this year for sure mm -hmm. And again, as we're required, we there's a five year, so you'll see how we we cycle through the different yep. buses at the different times. Um, our, you know, as well as the mechanics, obviously analysis of the buses. We typically, um, like in this round, um, what we're looking at is uh, is 2011 uh, buses, so they're nearly 11 years old, which is a little older than we'd like. Some are at the hundred or, or above the hundred thousand. Some are just under the hundred thousand. Um, the minibus, uh, the one that I want to replace with the wheelchair, um, is a 2010. Um, it only has it has 91,000 miles on it, but again, at 2010 with 12 years, Year. and with the salt up here, um, we tend to lose quite a bit of the undercarriage. Um, and then the other, the M5, which is a 2014, actually has 106,000 miles on it already. So um, again, this is a round town travel. So. <laughs> just kind of tells you how much they move um, the uh, other bus that would be going out um, is a 2011 um, full-size 77 passenger uh, which has about 74,000 but we've been having a lot of problems with it so uh, even though the the mileage isn't as much of the, the, the deterrent to it as the age is can we get buses now? Is that even an option? I mean, are they still Yeah, waiting? I mean, are we, we were supposed to get the, the buses for that we ordered. Now, we also, I go into the process of, of placing the orders in, in like um, in May, even you know right around when town meeting is, is going. I've actually already got my stuff out there. I'm waiting for the numbers because I can get the numbers and I can not approve them if we don't have the money. Um, but even with doing that this year, they were supposed to come in initially late October then we got told it'd be probably early December and now we've just been told you know sometime here in January we're supposed to receive it so of the coming school year yeah so we're a full year 12 months away is the earliest we should expect. no for that's, that's the one that we ordered year. last oh, okay. year in May okay. so it's taken almost nine months okay to uh get the one so I mean you know again um you know the, the process time-wise is, is just as soon as we can 
do it. Like I said, I'd go through the same process in May. I would go out to bid, get all my numbers, and, and just wait to see what the town approves and then make the decision from there. Okay. Sure. Mr. Bruder, questions? Uh, regarding the tech technology, um, if you could, and I know this is larger narrative, we had chatted uh, a year ago about the, the idea of the <clears throat> revolving account for tech replacement. Mm -hmm. I understand the need. Um, how does, if all goes to plan with that, how does the current CIP request marry over like years? Because I know w what we're working on is long-term steady replacement. And it's just where education is and we're already there. We had to go a bit faster than we had originally planned, but there we are. Um, is that something you can comment on in terms of kind of like the, the trade-off between CIP versus revolving with some of the yeah, stuff? Yeah, I, I think the, um, <clears throat> The advantage we've had in this town is obviously a good working relationship with the uh, finance department, which has allowed us when we've done um, CIP requests that if we didn't spend the full amount and we won't spend money unless we have the, the need isolated and we've got the best price we can get for it and we can go forward. So even though the town will give us money for any given item, we always are, are looking to push it as far as we can. So the relationship we've had is even though we've had an article um, done let's say for fy 21 if we didn't spend the full amount they've allowed us to carry it forward Fine. that has always allowed us to cover ourselves as we've needed to make a bigger replacement in, in another year because we might have carried fifty thousand forward from one year took the two hundred thousand had enough to do what we needed to do on that two hundred fifty thousand level if that becomes or changes then having that stabilization fund for technology is going to be a requirement because there's, there's just no other way to be assured that that money would be sitting there to level off the uh ups the ups and downs okay thank you for the context i appreciate it mr Pearson? you know music's close to my heart as you probably would know you wouldn't be surprised so i appreciate you're trying your hardest to keep that happening um, and I think you know it because you've done your research and I know Cammie and the music department has done it, but you know, they, they're trying to get a bang for their bucks out of that 56,000. Right. So you said it in your presentation, they're 20 years old. So, you know, in, in some ways, I think it's a good bang for the buck if they're going to take care of it and repair it. And we are fortunate in this system that our musicians are trained well to take good care of the equipment. Um, it, it's a very tough thing to explain sometimes if you don't understand music, that a tuba right. is a tuba and a bass is a bass, right? And so I, I totally get it. So I certainly appreciate it. And you know, it's it, you looking. It's only looking for two more years. So maybe it's it's a doable right. thing at, at the number that it is. Um, and I also appreciate that if if it doesn't work out, but you're able to use something else because the number is what it is, maybe you can do that. So keeping it on the radar, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. This this music department deserves it, and this 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 town deserves it for music. So I appreciate that. And they were 20 years old when we first heard the proposal three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the truth. Just, I'm just kicking it forward, Rich. But you're right. <laughs> and I was going to say you can analyze what the repair costs are. I don't think it's oh, going to. I don't think knowing enough about it, it's not going to come to 56,000. But there is repair costs to maintain it. Well, it's actually the. You're 100 percent right. There's there is a, a real ticket item for that. But the the reality is many of the items that we're asking to replace are items that even our people who repair them say you're you're really kind of past that. Exactly. It's kind of like you don't put a, a new engine in a, in a you know 30 year old car and think it's going to be a, a brand new car. It's just not, and you're spending a lot of money. So, and that's kind of the problem is that the cost gets higher and higher as the thing gets older and older um, to keep repaired. To your point, we've been for the, for all of our band, our, our uniforms, everything we have. I think the kids and the the staff have done a phenomenal job keeping it in, in excellent shape. You don't see anybody mistreat any of this stuff uh, because they have too much respect for what they like uh, to do, and that is the music program. So um, this is not an area that you ever have to worry about the kids you know, being destructive right. or having any kind of other thoughts. These are their pieces of equipment. They want to make sure they're the best they can be, and they want to sound the best they can. So it's a really good investment, and again, it's, I think, long overdue, but you know, obviously we understand again the constraints and we'll do the best we can with them. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Burroughs, calendar discussion. So in your packet you have two calendars. They're very similar as far as the traditional when we would begin with our staff in August 
and when the first day of school would be for students, which would be after Labor Day. The reason that you have two calendars in there, the only difference really is, as you know, we have five professional development days when students are not um, present, and just as we're having uh, one at the end of next week in January. There's been a lot of conversation in years past of the idea of taking that January day and having it in March. There's pros and cons to that time of year based on because we really get as much as we can out of those days. But with this particular year, not that it's going to change now, but we've had that conversation again. So with our um, Foxborough Education Association, we've put the two calendars forward to them. They've brought it up in the past as far as having the day in March, not having it right after the holiday. The nice thing, particularly at the high school level where it's positioned in January, is it comes between the two terms. Right. So if you have half semester, I mean semester courses, yeah. it ends nicely mm -hmm. there as mm -hmm. far as that time period. But we've also um, experienced many times with if we had had the day in March, some of the data and some of the things that we're looking at that we would like to do, it would be better positioned. So at this point, just wanted to bring it here, not for your vote this evening, although it is something that needs to be voted by school committee. We'll bring it back on January 25th. We're continuing to have conversations, but just wanted to bring it to you in case, you know, there's conversations you have with anyone, mm -hmm. um, with, with families, if it makes, you know, a difference of it being in January versus March. Thank you. Dr. Barris, sorry. I had a bit of a brain fog there. Has, um, has the, uh, the teacher membership of the, 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 is the association weighed in on either? Yes, they're fine either way. Okay. Um, and, and we also look at this as if we did go with a March date, we would try it for a year and then reassess and see if that really makes sense. Um, th they're good to try either way. So we're kind of thinking professional development and what's slated for next school year. And at the same time saying we've talked about it for years. Yeah. Let's try it and see if it makes a difference from us from a teaching and learning standpoint when we think about where that falls on the calendar. And did your, your leadership team have an overwhelming... Uh, the end? leadership team is in favor of the March date. Interesting. Okay. For the reasons you stated. That makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I read it, and I think we can should talk more about it too, but um, I have always thought that, in my experience, that sometimes there would be a great opportunity in March too, but I think it also do, does depend, I think you already said it, on, on what you're going to do with the day. Is, and I, I, I know that there are challenges if you get too late with PD, what, what can you get done? You know, you've, you've gone through a cycle and, and you're, you have time to implement or study or evaluate, right? So um, I think that's valuable feedback that if the leadership team and or the teachers are in favor of the march and can still find value in the day, that, that could be an you know, opportunity for a shift too. And then the only other thing that, that's noticeable is that you get, ex there are some days off in January already, right? Yeah. That, thank you so, for bringing so that, that up. That's yes. kind of a kicker too. And, and we all know in education that the time between February vacation and April vacation is, is about eight full weeks, right? <laughs> it's like straight it's through. it's optimal it's time. Like, right. Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes I think March has a nice sweet spot. And, and then you got to worry about the extra days in January is that good or bad. So. And that was, that was a big part of the administrative conversation, too, is disrupting those weeks. So if we think about next week, we're trying not to disrupt two weeks. So if you have the Martin Luther King holiday on Monday, our professional development day is on Friday, so it's only disrupting students' week once. Mm -hmm. right. But otherwise, you look at that with where the term ends, and then it ends up disrupting three weeks. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Community report. Burgess and Dr. Mello. We'll turn this one over to Dr. Mello. She's the one that has done all the work here. All right. So as you know, we put together an annual community report. It goes out to all of the households in the town of Foxborough. So not just our students and families, but every taxpayer. And it really is designed to give a snapshot of the schools what we value, what we're working on, what we're proud of, and who we are. So this year, there are some notable changes to the community report. The first one being on the front page, where we've shifted net from our strategic plan to our planning for success with our four pillars for success and our strategic objectives. So 
I think that's great because we've, we've talked about it here at this committee. It is driving the work, not just for this year, but for the next several years. And it really gives some insight into what the schools are working on. Um, when we turn to the inside, thinking about the did you know, uh, it's a nice couple of little sound bites for people who may not be familiar with the schools. So things like, like Bill just talked about, that we own our own buses and we have our own transportation and we don't charge fees for athletics, that we're one-to-one -one with our devices. Those things are important, extended day. Um, a little bit about our demographics. This year we added some information. Last year we had a lot of information in here about COVID and COVID protocols because mm -hmm. that's where we were and that's what we were doing. This year shifting back, taking a look at some of our demographic data who our student body is, um, as we know, our demographics have changed. And thinking about who are the students in our schools, uh, what are their profiles, what are their academic profiles, what are their cultural profiles, what are some of our select populations, and then thinking about at our high school level, the courses that we offer, the advanced placement opportunities, how many students are participating in those and testing in those, and then what is our snapshot of our SATs. Um, sometimes people in the community are interested in seeing what that looks like. And on the back page, uh, just reporting out about some things that are happening in our schools. So what's new at our elementary schools, our middle and our high school? Um, where are we making headlines as Richard always uh, is a champion for the music program? We'd be remiss if we didn't shout them out and their continued accomplishments. Uh, last year, even with COVID and even virtually, they were invited to Ellington once again and did very well. Um, thinking about things that are, are new and growing, like the Seal of Biliteracy, uh, our DECA Club, our Project Lead the Way, things we talk about often here, but the greater community might not know about. Of course, an update on the Borough School. I think having the ribbon cutting was an awesome opportunity for people from the town, some who had attended there, who might be in you know, retired life at this point to go in and see what the school looks like now and see how spaces have been reimagined and will take students into the future. And then some of our key priorities around equity and inclusion and thinking about, uh, again, when students are at our high school, what is the next step for them? You know, how many go on to college? How many go on to trades? How many go on to military? And pointing out that we now have the um, AP capstone diploma for students who participate in a um, certain number of required AP courses. So it's really just a nice snapshot. Um, and the, the information, some of it is consistent year to year and some of it does change. We like to share where our students have recently been accepted to colleges. It is tricky the time of year we do this because we don't have all of the information in yet. Uh, but this is our most current, literally hot off the press uh, that we have up to date. So some of this reflects you know, early decision and early acceptance and things like that. So I don't know if you have any thoughts um, or if I left anything out, Dr. Berto, that you wanted to add. No, I, I just as, as you had already pointed out, I, I do think it's that one tangible document that people can share within the community and get that snapshot of what's taking place in the in the schools and each year when we talk about what's going to go in it what's going to be different do we need to change it up we changed it up last year because of COVID, as it was mentioned but even but the year before that we changed it with some of the different information but feedback from you because you live in the community you hear from um, families of what would be important from from your viewpoint that if there's something that we've missed yes yes for your consideration i knew that at least <clears throat> it was 1.5 years ago but everything's changed um that one of the desi school report card measures were advanced advanced classes now foxborough's obviously has is put a lot into the uh the ap realm but it might be interesting to broaden that because I believe, but you can correct me, that there are uh, courses on the books which are not strictly AP, but also but do qualify for the state's designation of an advanced coursework, whether that's a more advanced Project Lead the Way course, a more advanced music course, a more advanced language or art course. Uh, some of the independent studies sometimes qualify. Just interesting, not for now, but just as a consideration for the future to broaden that so it's not strictly under AP or that which is purview of the college board. 
and that's interesting. And the other possibility, possibility, <laughs> to consider adding are things which you consider to be um, professional training, whether that's in more of the vocational area, whether that's some of the leadership stuff that you've been bringing up and things like that in terms of numbers of kids taking those courses, however you broadly want to define it, but it's potentially an interesting, I know you've all been working on it, and it's potentially an interesting umbrella to add in really a variety of uh, courses and a variety of kids who are taking things within that very recently expanded suite of options that you all have been working towards. So just, just as suggestions on that, on that front. So are you, I, I just wanna be clear on what you're suggesting. So thinking, I'm never clear on what I'm suggesting. <laughs> thinking about broadening the scope so that it's, we're not just talking about things that make you uh, college ready, but career ready as well, because exactly. we have enhanced those pathways. Exactly. Perfect. Well, even the elective courses that you've approved are some great examples of those that are really yes. going more towards career in some cases. Right. And the reason you've been adding them is because you value them. And I think we measure what we value. So let's put it down. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah. Finding the space for it, too. Well, yeah. Yeah, right. that is the tricky yeah. part. You might need you have no idea. You have, you, have, <laughs> you have room for half a text box that's on right. page two. <laughs> well, so, so I... It, and I think those are great t ideas to consider and create. So I, I think maybe the question we, c we could or you could ask yourself as you design is, I, I am very much attracted to the did you know? Yes. Wow, that was, that, like that's interesting, know. that's unique, right? Then the next paragraph, what's new? That's unique and interesting to Foxborough, right? Mm -hmm. The headlines, unique and interesting to Foxborough. So that's where you're going with it. It is. And, and w we could probably spend a lot of time talking about the second page of boxes of percentages and numbers and all that kind of stuff, yes. is that unique or is it findable in other ways? Do we need it or not? So mm. I, I'm not saying run away from those numbers and stuff right. too, but, but you know, someone nowadays, we could probably look up something and find out yeah. X. We could find the number, right? We talk about it in teaching all the time. What do we need to memorize and teach? Maybe we don't. So maybe we take one of the boxes out that we can easily find yeah. and put something in that has the creativity. It's, it, it's an interesting thought. Well, it's only, be, I mean, because your, your strategic goals, your actions, and the actions of your leadership team and your teachers writ large have brought more to bear in just those two areas than are demonstrated here. Yep. And, I think that's a great and it doesn't point. need to be for this year. It doesn't need to be for this round. I'm just saying, consider it like, right. take some credit for that, please. And, and also, because then it's an interesting thing for you all to track. I, I really appreciate your joint point here, but thinking about, we say that in school all the time, if you, if you can Google it, why are we teaching it? So I think that's a very fair point. In the, the past, there has always been a data component to this. It's yes. fluctuated from per pupil expenditure to culture and climate data to MCAS data. Um, obviously, that we didn't feel that was a valuable data point in the previous MCAS uh, mm -hmm. testing environment we were in. But I'm glad you um, left it off. But I think that's a good, I think that's a really... Definitely something to consider because the reality is there is a lot to talk about here. There is, there is a right. lot. It is very difficult to find real estate, and this does take up a lot of real estate. So I think that's. I, I really appreciate the feedback. It's yeah. helpful. No, thank you for the work. This is. I I love the document. I really do, Thanks. and I love what it says about us in. 2.3 pages. Because <laughs> it has to fold the right way in order to mail it. <laughs> the fold comes in. Yeah, but I'm counting a, the margins. I have to leave a third for the mailing. Head. You do. I hate that third, but yes. All right. No, thank you very much. Thank you. Always appreciate the numbers, so thank you. Uh, next, acceptance of donations. Mr. Yukta? Or Dr. Burroughs? Combination. Start with the Meditech one. Um, we are so appreciative of Meditech being in Foxboro and being able to receive this grant from them. It's increased from 10,000 to 15,000 wow. in the last couple of years, and it's um, funds that we use to go towards like Project Lead the Way, something that's going to be in the technology innovation mm -hmm. area, and it's mm -hmm. provided us the opportunity to either expand to an extent that we wouldn't have been able to do without those grant funds. And in the past, we've had the opportunity to go and to share with them and present what we have done with those funds. It's changed obviously in the last you know, mm -hmm. two years that we've been 
living through. So very appreciative of them continuing to support us. And it does truly make a difference. I don't know if you sure. want to add anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the um, components of Project Lead the Way as a startup can be cost prohibitive. So as you re will recall, we started with a grant from Project Lead the Way. There was one particular uh, module we were very interested in that was cost prohibitive, but with the continued support of Meditech, we may be able to explore adding that to our complement next year. So it's something that we're looking into right now. So we are very fortunate to have them as a community partner. Um, they have been unwavering in their support and also in their trust that we use these funds to really enhance the offerings for students. So. Um, we're very grateful to them. I hope we get back to being there in person with them and sharing what we do because Absolutely. they genuinely like to hear yes. sure. and see what the students are doing. Sure. And it is fun to be able to share what they're doing. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's impressive. No, I look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next time they come on the cycle for the teaching and learning highlight yeah. because I remember the last time it was so interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if, if I get to put any, if, if anybody cares about my preference. <laughs> so, so, no, thank you. Um, may we have a motion to accept the donation from Meditech? I move to accept the very generous uh, donation from Meditech for $15,000 with very much gratitude. I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, ask one more question about that? Yeah. I, I'm sure you thank them profusely. I, I'm convinced of that, so I got to <laughs> if, if you need us to do anything special to please. thank it and make it more personal, please make sure you tell us. So I don't want to get in the way or interfere. You, you can read their own thing that says they don't really want anything. A simple acknowledgement is all they want. But, yeah. but I it do is, send them a formal letter. I, I'm sure thanks. you do. I'm sure you do. But if you ever needed us to do a personal outreach, for if that would we would gain any value we, I'd, I'd be happy to but i'm not saying i need to so I just rich, to rich can it. play thank music you. and rob dance. bring my saxophone and, huh? and, and play thank you song or something <laughs> like that. i want i appreciate that thank you <laughs> and the, then the, the, the second one thank you <laughs> from the uh foxborough kickers club as you have known from all the years past whenever they are seeking additional coaching staff then the booster clubs have put forward that. So you have a donation from them for $2,000, which is for the assistant coach for soccer. Thank you. For the girls soccer, I should say. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question about this? Just make sure, and I'm sure it's okay, but maybe you can just teach me. Is there any issue that the check is not going to the school system and going direct to a person? I'm sure you've surmounted that already or you've dealt with that, but. And I, 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 I did not go do my research on what the past was. I, I apologize. But this, this check here that we're looking at is made out specifically to a person. And I just didn't, I, and I don't, I, I just want to make You're sure right. it's okay. I did notice that. I didn't think it, about because it. Because it's typically to the schools and it goes it's, into that account and then goes out. And I, well, I know the intent. I know the reason. We know the background. There's no issue there. But you know the job was done. I, I get that, but yeah. I just don't know procedural-wise if there's any caution. <clears throat> the reason we have it go through us, I mean, this check came to us to give out to, so that's kind of the only control we had on it. But the reason we do it typically the other way is to make sure that we have all of the controls on the quarries and everything else like that. Um, and they, they end up being our employee, even though, you know, somebody else is paying for it. They are still watching our, the yeah. students and, and our thing. So we don't really like the check going to the person or being named to the person we'd like it coming to us. And, and as uh, Dr. Berto said, uh, we would normally, you know, rewrite the check on our side and send it back out. Um, and I think we will just re remind them for future that they, you. they need to continue to do that. Thank you. Just to make sure so that it, it doesn't get, it, it yes. could get bottlenecked all of yep. a sudden and, we, and then we're all surprised. So. so that being said, do we need to approve this since it was not going to, or do we just want to acknowledge that it happened? Interesting. Uh, I think you can just acknowledge it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You guys are pretty good with that? I'm good I with am. that. Okay. Yep. So we would like to acknowledge the generous uh, or donation from the uh, Foxborough Kickers Club to the girls soccer assistant coach for this past season and uh, wish them luck for next season. For a job well done this yeah. season. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being that, Mr. Pearson. Uh, any other matters? Just would like to continue to thank people for their flexibility with um, some of our different events, whether they're sporting events. You know, in my communication yesterday, I noted that we're going down to four spectators per player for each oh. visiting, and then for our own 
to again to reduce the capacity and to really be able to distance based on what we're living through right now. Same thing with all of our concerts, really spreading those out, limiting capacity to be able to still have them, but to do it in a way with some additional mitigation strategies of what's taking place um, with the surge. And again, we want our students to be able to have the opportunity, but take those additional manage, um, you know, measures and so we're just appreciative for people with their um, patience mm -hmm. and their flexibility and knowing that as Jen Rosenberg said and we always do safety is our priority mm -hmm. and people might not always like the decisions that are made but they always are made mm -hmm. with safety being number one thank you mm -hmm. but whether it's you know our Taylor um, musical that took place over the weekend which right. ended up being great and, and thankful to DPW too to be able to allow that still to happen Friday night um, to be able to do extra attention to the sidewalks so they could have that Friday night so I know Chris Gallagher and I were in conversation and he's like nope we'll have extra attention to sidewalks so we we're really appreciative for them even though we had the snow day and being able because that's not something that you could easily postpone right, yeah. so lots going on from our elementary all the way to our high school seniors Thank you. Dr. Mello? I think I would just extend that appreciation for the flexibility to all of our teachers and staff and administrators who have just really demonstrated some Herculean efforts to maintain, uh, you know, at teaching and learning in, in a time where we've had to cover each other's classes and move around and um, be here. And everyone has been unbelievably positive and pleasant in a very challenging time. So I think just to give them a shout out for that because everyone's tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think, and this has been, a, the, the Omicron variant has been a wake up to us, that, 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 um, at least in my opinion, that it's been a wake up, that we have to remain, you know, at least mindful of, of you know, healthy practices. So yes. thank you. And if I may just add one other thing, just because we haven't had a meeting since we came back, you know, we found out the last minute over the break about the tests that were going to be delivered to us from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. And getting the message out to all of our staff to come on a Sunday to come pick those up. We had 341 individuals that we were able to hand those out on a Sunday, quickly being able to turn that around. And I think really? to Allison's point, everyone was so appreciative mm -hmm. and you know happy and just thankful for being there and um, it made our time there handing them out even that much better. But it just, it, it really is. I'm so glad you said that because yeah. whether it's covering classes with our staff absences or our substitute teachers that have come in um, during this time when so many districts I've heard from colleagues as you have as well, yes. they're subs, it's hard to have subs anyway and then they don't wanna come in during this time period. And our substitutes um, have really been Unbelievable. great. So yes, yes. Thank, you. thank you, thank you. Mr. Yukna. I have nothing. Yeah. Mr. Reuter? Um, uncharacteristically, three things. One, uh, I thought the Burl Open House was a rousing success for my view of it, and so grateful for the thought that everyone at the Burl, <clears throat> leadership through parent volunteers put into it, and to the teachers for honestly letting the community just run through their classrooms and look at stuff. I know that's hard for a lot of teachers, but just hearing the appreciation of Community, community members, some of whom had kids in the school, many of them whom did, some of whom didn't. Uh, they were just so excited to see the space and what you all have done with the space to make it a living, breathing educational institution, and I thought that was just lovely. Um, two, on the other end of the age spectrum, shout out to the high school for, at least for my little view out the submarine, all the work that the teachers and administration have been doing to make ninth graders who effectively many of them for if nothing extraneous was going on in their lives beyond all the extraneous that we had with covid they they found uh parts of eighth grade to be less taxing than say ninth grade for reasons that are understandable and appropriate uh just the level of comfort that a lot of the ninth graders have in facing their first midterms coming up because of the overt efforts of administration guidance and the faculty to make them feel comfortable is palpable, at least within my context in the community. And then lastly, um, related to Omicron and everything else, I'm so glad that you and your administrat administrative team stayed the course. Um, we have more hours in, 
than many districts in the last two years, and that's owing to you all standing fast to that which you thought was best for kids in the face of not a lot of happy people on either side. So just thanks. That's it. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. I, I wanted to just echo what, what Dr. Berto said about our community just to, and what Brent just said, to stay the course. Uh, my personal interest is that we, we have kids that stay in school, uh, come to school every day, and school yes. is open every day for students. And then um, with that comes all the activities and all the things that come with going to school for the students. So we have to make some tricky decisions during the surge that, that, that may you know, place us in certain different unique positions, but we got to do it because the goal is to keep the kids in school. The students pass by only once as a senior and only once as a junior and only once as a sophomore. Um, but I do respect the parents do the same thing as well. <laughs> so we just got to keep collaborating and get through this together. So I don't think anyone's intent is to, uh, to cause anxiety or to, uh, to constrain anything. It's just to keep us all with our eyes on the ball, so to speak. So thank you for doing that. And I hope the community understands that that's what we're trying to do. That trying to create the right dynamic for everyone to get through this. Um, we got some time. We have a new DES uh, Department of Ed mandate. I think the surge, you know, will end at some point, you know, and we oh. probably will see the end of the surge. That's that what I understand to be the case. So let's just stay the course and get through it. We've done really well um, to try to maintain as much as we could. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of items, uh, additional items. So first, uh, in Sarah's absence as a representative to the rec department, um, she did want to put a reminder out there that the Ties and Tiaras event through the rec department is still um, scheduled for February 11th, I believe is the date. Is that right? So first, second, thank you for bringing this up. I did also want to congratulate the production crew and staff, excuse me, and cast. Um, of Moana. I know it was a great success. I know they're excited that they got to do all of their performances and I, uh, I know how much work goes into one of those performances so really happy for them. Um, third, I want to echo um, I thought the Burl Open House was a great event. If people in the community have not had the chance to see the, the uh, reimagined Burl Elementary, the next time there is an opportunity to do that, I would highly encourage you to do that because it really is um, it's really a great space to walk through. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, the imagination that architects have, and, and you know, building design, all it's it's really it's a it's a it's a great accomplishment. So, um, if you have a chance, if you haven't had a chance to see it, please do take that opportunity. Okay, what I got to keep a list. Uh, um, next on my list was uh, I was quite shocked um, by about the announcement with with about Diana's retirement, um, simply because. She's been a constant for my experience at the high school. So I personally, I, um, I know I'll have another opportunity to do this, but um, I do want to thank her for all of her years with Foxborough and, and certainly congratulate her on whatever is next for her, but did want to acknowledge that um, I, I hadn't realized that she was even close enough to consider retirement because I just don't think of, you know, that, that I'm, I'm going to stop because that's a very dangerous sentence to continue, but I want to congratulate her there. And finally, I know you talked about the test distribution um, right before the, the um, holiday break ended. Um, I also want to commend you, um, and I'm sure there are many other people involved, but we actually, my family was out that afternoon, the Sunday before school started again, saw your car outside the offices, um, and my wife pointed out, she's like, why is Amy at this administration offices on Sunday afternoon. So, and I didn't think about it at the time because I, I know how much time you spend, or you all spend, dealing with school matters on you know outside of normal business hours. So I didn't think about it at the time. And then that evening, it caught up to me about why you were probably there. So, as much as I'm very grateful for the the you know the teachers and staff and their participation and willingness to be flexible, I really do think that we sometimes don't give you all enough credit for the work that you do um, at all hours <laughs> of the day uh, and night to make all this happen. So um, we, I did notice that you were there. Thank you so much. Um, and that's all I had to, that's all I wanted to add. So. Dr. Mello was there with me. Nurse <laughs> I'm sure, was there. I'm sure. Yeah. We just saw one car, but I'm sure that there were many people that were involved in making that happen. So um, it, it is, it is a, a, sometimes it can be thankless, but I hope that you guys do know how much we appreciate um, all the work that goes into making 
this town and this school system run. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, um, just a reminder, our next meeting is scheduled for January 25th. I think I have the date right this time versus oh, last right. time. Yes, I wrote it down at the very beginning. So right. next meeting is January 25th. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Thank Second. You. Thank you. All in favor? <laughs> Thank you, guys. Stay warm. Okay.